Thank you all so much for coming. This is such an exciting event. I'm the president of the Federal Society here at John Marshall, and we are thrilled that the American Constitution Society has teamed up with us for this debate. I want to extend a profound thank you to ACS for keeping these types of conversations alive, because engaging in discourse with each other is crucial. Before we introduce our esteemed speakers, I just want to read our mission statement for those of you who aren't familiar with our organization. The Federalist Society is founded on the principles that the state exists to preserve freedom, that the separation of government powers is central to our Constitution, and that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judiciary to say what the law is, not what it should be. We are incredibly lucky and honored to have Professor Schwinn and Shelby Emmett here with us today. Shelby just flew in from DC, where she is currently the Director of Free Speech Initiatives for Stand Together Foundation. Shelby graduated from Michigan State before attending the David A. Clark School of Law in DC. In addition to countless other endeavors and accomplishments, she was the legislative fellow with the Republican Study Committee, which is the largest caucus in the House of Representatives. And she's also worked for several organizations protecting free speech rights, including the Foundation for Individual Rights in Education and the American Legislative Exchange Council. Thanks for being here, Shelby. We're so excited to hear your thoughts on hate speech today. I'm going to hand it off to Sabrina to tell you a little bit about ACS and introduce Professor Schwinn. Thank you, everyone, for coming today as well. My name is Sabrina Kirakaya, and I am the events coordinator for the JMLS chapter of the American Constitution Society. Uh, the American Constitution Society, otherwise known as ACS, so if you see our flyers, um, that's us, was founded to promote the vitality of the US Constitution and the fundamental values that it expresses, which is individual rights and liberties, genuine equality, access to justice, democracy, and the rule of law. Now to introduce our speaker, Professor Stephen D. Schwinn teaches constitutional law, comparative constitutional law, and human rights here at the University, University of Illinois in Chicago, John Marshall Law School. He is the editor of the American Constitution Society Supreme Court Review and co-editor of the Constitutional Law Professor blog. His writings have appeared in a variety of popular and academic periodicals. Now we'd like to start off today uh, by having each side articulate their stance on the issue of hate speech. We're giving you each three minutes to state your premise. Professor Schwinn, take it away. Can I defer to uh, our guest, Shelby? Sure, you can absolutely do that. Can you guys hear me? Okay, uh, so I'm Shelby. Um, I'm from Detroit, so you should already know where I stand on this. Um, I'm from Detroit, get over it, right? Your feelings are not going to get you through a bad circumstances. You have to be strong, and I've carried that work into my actual life. Um, anything that is already going to quote unquote hurt you in an actual physical way is already outlawed. These are things called assault. These are things called threats. This is why, you know, we can go after ISIS and Al Qaeda and, you know, uh, why I could work in domestic violence and get PPOs against men or people that were trying to be, you know, women or trying to hurt people. Um, but words in and of themselves requires you to be able to get be stronger, not the rest of society to bow to whatever your comfort level is. Um, the main reason I'm against hate speech is because who's going to define it? Last time I checked, uh, I'm a black woman. I'm 12% of the population. If you cut that in half, I'm about 8.6% of the population. The last thing that I want is another man, particularly a white man, who's had the history of doing nothing but knock me down, sit here and define what I'm allowed to say versus what I'm not. I'll take it a step further. I'm biracial. So does the half white side of me get to make the rules or does the half black side of me get to make the rules? And what if I change what I want that to be or what if I get more money or less power? What if I make another $100,000 a year or I lose my job? Does that change the dynamic of what I'm allowed to say to you and how you respond to it? I think it does because what we don't want are people who already have the power defining on what you are allowed to say and what you're not allowed to say. And I'll take it a step further and say, I think a lot of this hate speech stuff, a lot of this microaggression stuff, although real, is also a way to make sure that the dominant society never actually has to have a real conversation. I'm gonna say that again. When we say we can't bring up things that make people uncomfortable, what that's really saying is, I don't want people to bring up things that hurt my feelings. 
And a lot of things need to be brought up in this country that hurt people's feelings. This is why we have a lot of the problems that we have. We spent a good 150 years on having a real conversation about the history of this country. And if we're going to allow anybody to say, oh, we're not going to allow you to say X or Y, I can tell you right now that last year, 23 states wanted to outlaw Black Lives Matter because they didn't like the way it made people feel about the police. And 60 years ago, people said that they didn't want to hear, you know, a bunch of people run their mouths about, you know, civil rights and, you know, how dare you beat me because I'm trying to vote because that made white people feel uncomfortable. And that was hate speech. And people actually said they didn't want Martin Luther King and Malcolm X to talk because, you know, it made them uncomfortable and that was hate speech. So every time you think hate speech, ask yourself who is defining it, and I promise you the people without the power are not going to be the ones defining it. That is why I do what I do, and it is why I will never support any limitation on hate speech, because I know the first people it's going to knock is myself, and the best part about free speech is you get to be very selfish and only worry about yourself. <laughs> Professor Schwinn. All right, thank you, and welcome, Shelby. Thank you very much for coming. I, too, am from Detroit, and uh, you may not know where I stand on free speech and hate speech. I'm going to take the opposite position today. What I'm going to try to do is defend some limited government regulation of hate speech. And I want to start by defining some terms and sort of charting the territory for us all here. First off, it's really hard to define hate speech. There's no question about it. The way I think about it is speech that is directed to an individual or a group based upon an immutable characteristic or an essential identity of the group that's designed to and actually does exclude them from a community. And that's really important to me because it encompasses the power dynamics that I think shall be alluded to, but they don't work both ways. In other words, when we're talking about the powers that be defining hate speech, or any speech for that matter, we really are talking about a power dynamic, right? And what I worry about with hate speech is not people calling uh, Black Lives Matter hate speech, for example. What I worry about is hate speech in the form of a Nazi swastika or a noose or people using the N-word for the purpose of excluding individuals or groups of individuals based on an immutable characteristic or an essential identity from a political community or from for example, a law school community. That's what worries me. So I'm actually amenable to the idea of some government regulation of hate speech. And I think if we look at US constitutionalism and free speech principles, what's going on with the First Amendment, we can actually see some limitations in our own constitutional approach that lead to the results that Shelby is suggesting that we shouldn't regulate hate speech at all. But when we broaden our scope and look internationally, look at the way other mature democracies deal with things like hate speech, or look at the way international human rights deals with hate speech, I think we can gain some insights as to the way US constitutionalism might want to think about dealing with issues of hate speech. So I look forward to the conversation. We're, I gather we're going to take a couple of minutes and sort of present our case and then do Q&A. Is that how it'll work? Uh, yeah, we have some questions here. Oh, you ask. have some questions yep. already? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Awesome. <laughs> All right. So my first question was actually how you would define hate speech, but you've both made it pretty clear that's a, that's a pretty heavy task. Um, so I guess my next question would be, should the federal government define hate speech, or should that be left to the courts? Whoever feels so compelled to go first. Well, so under our United States Constitution, right, it would, I would assume if we're going to do this in a formal proceeding, right, there would either be some type of amendment introduced and either the states would ratify it and take it to the feds or the feds would write it and then the states would have to ratify it, right? So let's act like we all have agreed on what that language would be to actually limit the First Amendment. Uh, we've already agreed that there would actually be no way for any of us to agree on that. My first question to you is, how many of you don't like Donald Trump in this room? Okay. Do you really want him defining what is hate speech? How many of you didn't like Barack Obama? Do you want him defining what is hate speech? Okay, I'm just gonna have some fun. Um, you're fat. Is that hate speech? Raise your hand. Uncle Tom. It's not? Oh, I guess it depends on the context, right? Um, you're a Nazi. It's 
So we can't agree. We don't know any idea what we're actually talking about. This is the point of hate speech, right? Um, so if you actually got your Congress to do something, which will not happen, um, I worked up there for four years. If any of you first think that any of those parties is one versus the other, eh, no, no, they're all the same. Um, you wouldn't, if I had to do this in any way, I would probably not want it to happen at the federal level because you've got more incompetent people in the federal level than you do at the state level. At least at the state level, they tend to be in session only 60 days a year, most only 30 days, and they actually have to go to church every day and like run into you at the grocery store instead of hiding out in DC, living off of everyone else's tax dollars and not knowing the price of milk. So you'd at least be able to hold them more accountable. But I'm also seeing a lot of intelligent people in the room here who still couldn't all agree on what one thing would actually be. So I'll say again, how many of you would want Donald Trump to regulate hate speech? Okay. So hate speech is really hard to define, um, but we're not, it's not like we're trying to, uh, to work without some ideas here. So for example, the Supreme Court's done a really good job of defining categories of speech that it essentially proscribes, right? Everything from libel to obscenity to, to, uh, to incitement speech to fighting words. These are well-established uh, well sort of exceptions to the First Amendment that the Supreme Court has carved out. We, we actually know how to do this. And if we look beyond our borders, we'll see that we know how to do it even better. The international community has done some really hard thinking about what hate speech is and what governments not only should but must under certain international human rights treaties ban in terms of the speech that they permit. Again, because it's alienating to individuals, not because it works both ways or we don't want Barack Obama or President Trump defining it, but because it takes people out of the political community in a way that is essentially denying them a fundamental political right, the right to free speech and participate in politics. I want to do a little thought experiment with you here. Shelby did a great job asking some questions to kind of drill down and figure out what is hate speech, but I want to take it in a slightly different direction. I've been giving some thought to talking to a, uh, to a diverse audience and trying to figure out what's the harm in hate speech? Is there any way that we could all sort of visualize together what is the harm in hate speech? What are we talking about? And really the best I can do is this. What I want you to do is imagine for yourself, you, and you don't even really need to imagine, figure out what's an immutable characteristic that you have or an essential part of your identity that you have. Maybe it's your race, maybe it's your religion, maybe it's your sex. Okay, you all have one? Anybody having trouble with this? No? Okay, good. All right, so you all have an essential characteristic. Now, what I want you to do is think about a stereotype or a slur that's associated with that characteristic, okay? Now, this might be just a shade harder, but let me give you a clue. If you can't figure out a stereotype or slur that's associated with your essential identity, you're probably in a pretty privileged class. You all have one? Are we together? Okay, now, I want you to imagine this. Just imagine, you're walking into the law school, okay, and the first thing that you see is a sign on the law school that has that racial slur, that has that stereotype. In whatever form it comes, it's right there on the law school. And you walk into the law school, you walk up to the guard stand, and you ask the guard, you know, I don't know where my class is today. Can you help me out? I need to find my class or my professor or the cafeteria or something, and the guard says to you, well, you know what? We don't serve your slur, fill in the blank. We don't serve your stereotype, fill in the blank, right? And so you say, well, okay, I guess I'm on my own. So you walk, and you find your class, and maybe you go to your class, right? And you raise your hand to talk, and your professor calls on other people with the opposite characteristic but refuses to call on you. And when your professor does call on you, they sort of minimize your comments and kind of diminish your, your ideas, and then tells you after class that the reason that they did that is because of your slur, fill in the blank, or because of your stereotype, right? And so at this point, you're feeling kind of frustrated, I would imagine, right? Maybe you're feeling like you don't have a voice in the law school community. Maybe you feel like you're being alienated from the law school community almost systematically, right? 
because these things are happening time and time again to you, and they're all consistent. They're perfectly consistent across the board. The message that you're getting, you're really starting to feel like, I don't belong here. I don't have a voice here. So if you feel empowered enough, and that's a big if at this point, because again, you're pretty alienated from the community. If you feel empowered enough, you find your way up here to the third floor to the dean's office, right? And you go to the dean's office and you say, hey, I've been slurred all over the place. I've been stereotyped all over the place. And I'm really feeling alienated from the law school community. And the dean says the same thing to you. She says, well, go away, get over it. Toughen up, right? You're from Detroit, aren't you? Toughen up, suck it up, and go back to work, right? Now, what's going on here is a systematic exclusion of you from the community, and importantly, from the political community. It's not only taking away your right to go into the law school free of that kind of harassment, it's also taking away your voice your First Amendment rights. And this is part of the reason that I think the US Constitution falls asleep at the wheel in these kinds of questions. The way we view free speech is atomistically or in isolation, right? A speaker has a right to free speech, to say whatever they want categorically. Well, that works all well and good until your speech runs into my right to free speech, right? What about my right to free speech, or my right to navigate the streets without harassment, or to navigate the law school without harassment? What about that? Well, the US Constitution typically doesn't take that into account, but you know what? International human rights does. And that's why so many international human rights instruments not only permit, but actually require governments to regulate hate speech and define it with the kind of precision and specificity that we see in Supreme Court definitions of things like incitement, for example. And governments go out and regulate that kind of thing. Now we can talk more about whether that's a good idea or a bad idea. What does it do for the marketplace of ideas? What does it do for self-actualization and other purposes of free speech? I hope we'll have that conversation. But I think it's important to understand that it's not just the speaker's rights that are issued here. It's the victim's rights, too. So Professor Schwinn brings up some exceptions to the First Amendment. Um, when are limitations on the First Amendment justified in America? Uh, so you guys already know these things, right? So I think there's a couple myths about the First Amendment. The first is, and it actually breaks my heart, there's a lot of, I, I speak to a lot of college kids, and those that claim to be for free speech, for some reason think that that means they also have to be an absolute jackass. And you don't have to be, right? You can still be respectful of people and still treat people as human beings and still believe in free speech, right? You can still do that. For some reason, there's this idea that if you're an absolute free speech absolutist, then you're just gonna be the worst person ever that nobody would ever wanna date. Um, so that's the first problem. Um, but of course, we already have these limitations. So we, we had this great example, and it actually was very relatable. I've been through this a lot in my life. Uh, being the only minority in a college class, being the only minority in my First Amendment classes, being one of the only minorities in First Amendment law now. And there are some limitations that we already have. So you already have a thing under Title IX in our education systems here. It's called discriminatory harassment. And what it basically means is that if something rises to the level of enough where it keeps you outside of the educational opportunities and experience, then it rises to an actionable level. But anything outside of that is unfortunately just someone being a horrible human being. And I think that uh, the professor is absolutely right here. But what I also want everyone to realize is in that same example that he was giving you, that's not going to change for you guys when you get outside the law school gate. You are going to have a boss who does not care about your feelings. You are going to live in a neighborhood where your neighbors just don't like you you are going to date somebody that treats you like less than a human being. And you have to learn how to cope with these things. And this idea that you can create an environment in your microcosm of law school and then expect the rest of the world to cater to it once you get outside of it, not only I think does you a justification as a lawyer, because you're supposed to be learning how to think objectively and put the law before everything else, but it doesn't prepare you for life generally. It just doesn't. And as much as we can create these theoretical things of the rainbow that my life should be, at the end of the day, it's still the world, 
And I think it's very wrong to tell people, particularly if they're minorities, that you can strive for a type of perfection that's not going to happen. And the best thing for you to do is to understand the realities of these things and to be able to be an advocate. And I think the, the biggest thing that I want to say here is what we're ultimately saying is we expect the government to regulate something instead of you all doing it yourselves. I want you to think about this for a second. When I was in seventh grade, this sticks with me because it's very important. A kid, I think, just had a crush on me. He was 13. You, you, you guys remember when you were like just dumb and you just said like really dumb stuff at 13? He came up to me and we were doing an art project and he said, look, your thumb. Mostly white high school, had no idea why this, what guy was doing this for. And I felt more bad for him. Like, why are you even saying this? But just like that, I can tell you what happened. We're at a table like this. Four out of the people on the table put their head down and didn't say a damn word. One kid did white kid, and he said, you can't say that, that's wrong, and you shouldn't say that. Now, the question is, why did those other four kids put their damn head down? More importantly, you know what happened? Instead of letting the kids figure this out, five minutes later, the intercom goes off, me and the kid get pulled down the office. So put this image in your head real quick. I didn't do anything. I was just a black kid in school, and I get pulled down to the office because of something a white kid said. And instead of letting a bunch of 12 and 13 year olds figure it out and expecting those other 12 and 13 year olds to stand up and put him in place, nope, we expected the adults to do it for us. But they didn't just expel him, they expected me as the black kid to say that I was offended first before something would happen. So all this taught everybody at that table was that the four people that sat there and put their head down were good people. They weren't, they were worse than the kid that said the word. And then the kid who said the word didn't even have an evil intent. I think the kid just had a crush on me. He was an idiot. But instead got treated like he was Hitler. And then here's me, who was the actual victim, expected to now get this kid expelled. And that was going to do what for race relations in my mostly white high school? All of this is teaching you guys is to expect somebody else to stand up for somebody. So when someone is disrespecting a woman or calling someone a bad name, you're all being taught to do this. And then look to the student diversity counselor or the campus university president or whomever the heck you expect to fight your battles for you. And what I want to ask is, why do we need a law on any of this at all? Don't you all feel like you have enough backbone to sit there and tell somebody that they're being a bigot? And if you don't, you really need to ask why. Because that's also part of being a lawyer. You've got to ask the tough questions, and you've got to be able to handle it. But this idea that you want a system to regulate who's being a bully for you instead of standing up, that's why you see those old pictures of you know, the, the Klan lynchings. An individual random racist is never going to go out and do that. You get a mob mentality. People feel comfortable because everyone sat there and didn't say anything. That's how Hitler came to power. A bunch of people sat there. <gasps> Maybe, maybe the, the goddess of the government will do something about it. Well, it didn't happen. But what's actually saved this country? It has never been a government. It's never been a Supreme Court. It's never been the government ever. It was people like Sojourner Truth. It was people like Elizabeth Cady Stanton. It was people like Martin Luther King. It was people like Malcolm X. These were people that had no power, no government entity. But you name me one government official that actually did something that actually protected people, it didn't happen. We had another 100 years of slavery because of this damn Supreme Court that all of us are taught to uh, bow down to, right? Those five people in black robes are the same people that said I was three-fifths a person, and then later said it was OK to treat me like I was nothing, even though slavery was over. And you want us now to put that power back into the same people to sit there and tell you what? That they're going to give you guys now the power to stand up for your fellow man. Government is never going to be the solution to this, you guys. It's got to come from in here. And that's why you have to protect hate speech, because at the minimum, it's teaching you how to stand up for other human beings. Do you have a response for that? Yeah, um, really well said. Thank you very much. So a couple of things. First off, um, 
you are going to face this in the in the real world, right? As if the law school is not part of the real world, you are. It's true, but that's why I advocate regulation in the real world too. I think that's really important, and I use the law school illustration simply because we're all part of the law school community. But before too long, you're going to be a part of the Chicago community, or the DC community, or the Philly community, or wherever you live and practice. And you're going to be dealing with these issues in that community in exactly the same way that I mentioned that you'd be dealing with them in the law school, just sort of writ large and much harsher and much harder. And that's exactly why we need to start paying attention and regulating to this kind of thing. Because when we allow people to exclude you from a community, a political community, a social community, whatever kind of community you're a part of, that's going too far. That intrudes in your rights, and that's where we need to stand up and do something about it. Now, I agree that government is not always the solution, but I think we go way too far to say that government is never the solution. And what Shelby is articulating is a form of the sort of free market of ideas, this kind of marketplace of ideas that's so fashionable at the Supreme Court right now with free speech. It's kind of an anything goes with free speech because what will happen is the good ideas will rise to the top. The bad ideas will sort of go to the bottom and go away. And we can persuade each other, yell at each other, argue with each other until that happens. But we can count on that happening. And so eventually things like hate speech will go away. Well, the marketplace of ideas is certainly one theory of free speech. I want to talk about some others. But when you hold up hate speech against the marketplace of ideas, you see pretty quickly that it just doesn't work, right? First off, let's start with the idea that no marketplace, whatever marketplace we're talking about, goes without government regulation. There's no such thing as a free market. Um, even in the economic marketplace. We might tell ourselves that there is in the United States, but no way. I mean, see the uh, SEC, see the CFTC, right? There's a whole alphabet soup of government regulators that regulate every jot and tittle of our daily lives. Um, and so too with free speech, although what we have this kind of fiction that there ought to be a marketplace of ideas. Well, the reason that we regulate um, an economic market is because we can see pretty readily that there are imperfections in the market that lead to kinds of inequalities that are intolerable in a marketplace. So too with the marketplace of ideas, right? When there are power dynamics in our society, as there are between white people and black people, for example, or between white people and Hispanic people, people, or between men and women, or between rich people and poor people, right? All the different kinds of power dynamics that replicate themselves in the marketplace for speech. What that means is my speech as an individual speaker is diminished or devalued by certain of my immutable characteristics or essential identities, yours too, and other people can outmatch us in the marketplace of speech. And so, does it make sense to have government come in and regulate speech in the same way that government regulates an economic marketplace when there are those kinds of inequalities? Of course it does. Sure it does. That doesn't mean that we're looking to government as the only solution to our problem, but we are looking to it as a portion of the solution to our problem. So when we talk about marketplace of ideas, the idea of hate speech and regulating hate speech speech it, or not regulating hate speech, it, it, just, it just doesn't hold up. But when we look at the other purposes of the First Amendment as well, we see that regulation of hate speech is pretty consistent with them. So if we think about speech as advancing our politics, right? Speech as a way to engage in politics, which is a really important idea in the First Amendment. Well, we see many of the same problems that we see in the marketplace of ideas with speech, right? Our immutable characteristics, our essential identities, maybe our wealth or our income or our power in society, those things weigh our speech in the political marketplace differently. And so, does it make sense to regulate the political market space and, and political speech to try to equalize the playing field and not have people excluded because of hate speech? I say absolutely yes it does, right? If your speech is causing me to lose my voice in the political marketplace, I certainly hope there's a remedy for that. There's a remedy for a lot of other things that you could do to me. Just because it happens to be speech, it shouldn't be remediable? Well, I think it ought to be. What about some other purposes of free speech? What about, for example, self-actualization, right? This idea that through communication, you and I can actually become better people by talking, by engaging, by conversing, by disputing, 
right? We actually learn things from each other and become better people. But what if hate speech shuts you down? If hate speech shuts you down, there's no self-actualization, there's no communication, there's no engagement, right? There's just hate. And that doesn't do anybody any good. If somebody's speaking hate speech to me, I don't want to talk to them. I don't want to have anything to do with them, right? And maybe I would cower, maybe I wouldn't cower, maybe I'd just say, well, I don't want to have anything to do with you. But in any event, it shuts down the speech pretty readily. Let me say one more thing about the marketplace of ideas. If anything, anything ought to persuade us that the marketplace of ideas is going to do away with hate speech, I present to you President Trump, elected president of the United States after spewing hate speech all over the place and continues to in the White House with apparently, apparently no repercussion, no sort of uh, pushback really in any serious way at all. Now, if the marketplace of ideas is supposed to get hate speech to kind of go away from our discourse, I'm afraid it's done just the opposite. It's elected the hater in speech in chief to be president of the United States. And so I think President Trump is exhibit A in my argument that the marketplace of ideas for speech just doesn't work. And if we're looking for the marketplace to solve the hate speech problem, I think we need to be looking someplace else. I just uh, add real quick, I'm sorry. Yes. Um, I completely agree with you. So as one of the very few minorities in my field, I think the way we talk about this is ridiculous. I think it's completely naive. There's never been a free exchange of ideas. I wasn't even allowed to go to half the schools that we run our mouths about the equality of education, all this crap until, what, 30 years ago? So I completely agree with you. We've got to stop talking about this nonsense in a very naive, you know, John Stuart Mill way, and that's all my field does. Um, but what I will push back on is, first of all, Donald Trump is not the top hater in speech, right? We've had presidents that shown Klan films in the White House. We've had presidents that said, you know, let's uh, just grab a bunch of Native Americans and ship them off to the West. We've had a lot worse presidents than we've had in, in right now. Um, I think what we need to realize and understand, though, is that with every single push of whether you hate Donald Trump or love Donald Trump, it doesn't really matter to me. What matters is I can name you just as many people in power who think anything that anyone says to push back against him is the exact same definition of hate speech. And the reason, if you hate Donald Trump and you think that man should just stop talking always, the only way that you can defend that truly is if you are going to defend that with anybody else who also thinks anything that anybody else says is just the worst thing ever in life, right? And the only reason that I'm perfectly fine with Donald Trump doing what he has to do is because there are so many people that I also work for that are doing everything in their power under the First Amendment to push back. Um, I've got the blessing right now of working with the NBA and the NFL right now because they're in a big problem, right? Um, in this country, we just sat here and insulted the President of the United States and nobody cared, right? We just sat here, we chilled, you guys are gonna go out later tonight, you might go study, but none of you are actually in fear of your life. None of you are. You might wanna do a hashtag oppressed, but you're not. I'm actually working with people right now that are terrified because they've worn Winnie the Pooh mask overseas. Because in their country, you can't tease their president. They can get killed for that. So I want you to think about that. As much as we may hate the people in this country that we hate because of the power that they have and the stuff that they say, the worst Donald Trump can do to you is tweet you and make you a meme. And all we can do back is keep doing it and he can't do anything to us and that's the beauty of the First Amendment. But I'm working with people that are younger than you right now who would do anything to be able to tweet and say something about a dictator or about anybody that they dislike. And now they can't do it. And our country is sitting here saying, well, I only care about it, you know, but I'm LeBron James and I have $45 million on the table, so now I don't care. So is it really hate speech or is it really more of a personal thing that you just want to feel comfortable? Because I also hate to break it to people, and I think this is other myth here. You don't have a right to be heard. It's not there. It's not in the First Amendment. Nothing about your feelings, nothing about your voice mattering. It's not there. You think Sojourner True sat there and said, oh yeah, my voice matters, America, I'm gonna run my mouth because you care. No, she kept fighting anyway. So I think you all have to get 
past this idea. You don't have a right to make sure people know where you're coming from. What you have a right to do is to live your life and to expose your views, but no one's got to listen to it. Just like you can shout down a speaker and you can block Donald Trump and you can do whatever you else you want. But every time you're going to do that, you have to remember the flip side. We're not like other countries. Other countries in the world are very monolithic. Maybe most of their populations are the same religion or the same ethnic background or the same race. That's not America. We don't have that luxury, everybody. We are one big, messy family. And I like to talk about the First Amendment the way I talk about Christmas, because Christmas outside of Halloween is the most kick butt holiday ever. And I'll say this, unlike the other rights that you have, I don't like guns. From Detroit, don't like guns. My mom has like 15 guns, she loves guns. Me not liking guns has nothing to do with my mom having guns. Me not liking free speech has everything to do with you guys having it or not. Because if he stops believing in it, and I stop believing in it, and you stop believing in it, now Santa Claus doesn't exist and we just stop talking. Even if we're yelling and screaming at each other and hating each other, we're still talking. It's not a bullet to the head, it's not a lynching, we're talking. We're talking. It's a start. It's a start, everybody. But what we have to be very, very, very concerned about is that the more and more you try to limit this, what you're actually ultimately doing is limiting yourself. And that's what ultimately we all have to be worried about. Uh, so, I, yeah, go ahead. Just a couple of things, really nicely said. Um, but just a couple of things to try to um, express a different view. So, um, it's true that in a lot of countries around the world, you can't speak your mind, right? And we couldn't be having this discussion at all, right? Much less criticizing our very own president. And we, it's a total privilege that we're able to do this and a real gift. And, and I thank, you know, thank country every day for that. But that other countries can't have this conversation doesn't mean that if we take steps to regulate speech in a sensible way, that we too can't have this conversation, right? There's a wide gap between those two things. And so I've never subscribed to the theory that if you infringe on rights a little bit, that that's going to lead to infringing on them a lot. Not necessarily so. We see the, we have for a long, long time infringed on absolute free speech rights in a number of different ways in this country. And a number of advanced democracies around the world have too. And yet we can still criticize our president and they can too, in some ways even more so than in our country. And so this idea that opening the door to a little bit of regulation means that you open the door to a lot of regulation, I just don't buy it. I'm much more sort of in the idea of looking you know, at the costs and benefits, at the general welfare, society welfare, inclusion, making sure that we're all a part of the community and we can all talk freely. Um, the other thing that I want to address, and this is something that we see in the Supreme Court doctrine, that there's this idea of viewpoint discrimination that equates I'm going to simplify here, but I, I think I'm capturing it accurately, hate speech with love speech, right? That those two things are equal in the sense that if the government discriminates in either way, it's discriminating by viewpoint, okay? So what the doctrine does is put these two kinds of speech, hate speech and love speech, or maybe non-hate speech if you prefer, on par with each other and says those are, they're, they're, they're a kind of equal value speech and we, the court or the government, shouldn't be in the business between, of distinguishing between the two because it'll lead to the parade of horribles that Shelby has described. I don't subscribe to that. I actually think we can identify hate speech and distinguish it from love speech. I think we can do that. We're a really smart group of people in this country and, uh, and I think we can figure that kind of thing out without unduly infringing on other First Amendment freedoms. Uh, so one more theory related question um, before I have a logistical question. Um, what do you do when the person, government, judge, university official is defining hate speech to the benefit of the perceived privilege and to the detriment of the actual oppressed? Both of you. But I I have a feeling you want to address it first. Um, well, I think that's the problem, right? I mean, I'm cool with regulating the heck out of hate speech so long as you guys let me be the ones that define it. 
um, I'm sure you all would feel the exact same way. I promise you if we all just ask for the top three things that you think should be outlawed, we're all going to come up with three different things. And I work on a lot of campus speech issues in, the, in here. And the top one right now is probably the way most schools are defining harassment, okay? There's actually a very detailed legal standard and it's got like, you know, words like pervasive in it and a bunch of commas and stuff like that. But what ends up happening is you're allowing your either most sensitive person or you're allowing the person that just knows how to play the game all the opportunity to take advantage of people. And I'll tell you in the way this has come up statistically. So I've worked a lot of Title IX cases the last few years, uh, a lot of sexual harassment cases. Some of the top people that are always con conveniently always brought in, don't get their adequate due process, or just presumed to be the bad guy, black men. Shocker. Shocker. You mean to tell me that we created a system defended uh, per, uh, intended to protect people, and the people that ended up getting screwed were minority men. Shocker. Um, I, I, I've got to disagree with you on one thing. There's never been a government entity that just kept it within the line it was supposed to be in. They've always gone too far. Every single time it's gone too far. Um, and this is what you've seen happen over and over again. The idea of Title IX when they changed these regulations in 2011 made sense. I've been in these situations. There did need to have a, be a huge crackdown. We both went to Michigan State. We've had our issues at our university. And these things needed to be handled. But what's ended up happening, unfortunately, is you get a lot of people brought into these systems who conveniently don't happen to have the same financial situation as the uh, people may be accusing them of something. They also conveniently happen to be a minority, and they also conveniently don't happen to have, you know, daddy's last name to help them out of a situation. But they also don't get a lawyer, they also don't get access to real due process, and now their entire record is scrolled because we had to care about harassment without defining it. We just cared about our emotions and our feelings. Meanwhile, a bunch of black guys just got screwed out of their education. Um, but we don't talk about that because we have to worry about the victim, right? And these are uncomfortable conversations, but we need to have them. It, it's, a, it's a real thing. This happens to minority men all the time. I worked in sexual assault in Detroit for years, and it happens all the time. And so no, I will never sit here and defend anything that's going to give this government more power to ultimately pick and choose who it's going to hold one standard for. And if you don't believe me, let's look at this opioid crisis. When I was growing up, and people that looked like me were on the same crisis, it was a crack problem, it was a criminal problem, and we had to lock them up. But now that they're suburban and they're white, it's a public health crisis, and we're gonna make my tax dollars pay for their treatment, right? Completely different, so don't tell me that there's not gonna be a different standard depending on who says it. And I can promise you if the person doesn't make enough money, if they live on the south side of Chicago versus the north side of Chicago, if they're from the suburbs of Detroit versus the inner city of Detroit, depending on who their last name is, they're going to be held to a different standard. And the only thing that makes us at all equal in this country is the fact that I can run my mouth just as much as the richest man in this country. And you can listen to me or you can block me, just like you can listen to Donald Trump or you can block me. But this idea that you think you're going to elevate my power and my privilege by silencing somebody else, one is insulting. I'm smarter and better than that. So don't let anybody tell you that you can't elevate yourself. And two, it's going to bite you. There has never been a law in this country that helped minorities and poor people and didn't destroy us first. Name me one and we'll talk. Voting Rights Act? Oh, come on. <laughs> really? <laughs> I, it's got its problems, to be sure. Yes. But Every minority in America feels like we can equally vote with no problem, yes. No, no, no. I didn't <laughs> say that. It hasn't gone far enough, but it's moving in the right direction. And if the Roberts Court didn't overturn it in 2013, or at least Section 5, then we'd be having a different discussion. I don't think that a lot of minorities would agree that everything was hunky. No, 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 I, no, no, but I want to be perfectly clear. I'm not saying that. It's absolutely not. And I agree that there's racial discrimination, just ridiculous racial discrimination all over the place in this society. But I don't want to conflate that with the discussion on hate speech. If the Voting Rights Act or Title VII or other government actions that are designed to 
combat racial discrimination in all its various and ugly forms, if those aren't working, that doesn't mean that we abandon hope for government regulation of, of hate speech or abandon hope for any of those things for that matter. We don't just throw up our arms. What we do is we continue to try and see what we can do, right? How can we improve the Voting Rights Act? How can we improve regulation of speech in a way that creates a more inclusive, equal kind of community where we all can participate? Um, a couple of things I want to address. One is, when we're talking about hate speech, I think it's really important to understand that we're not talking about the individual feelings of victims of hate speech. That's, that, that's a concern, but it's not really the principal concern in terms of free speech ideas. The principal concern, the one that I really worry about, is a larger sort of, sort of dignitary interest that we're trading on. And that does have everything to do with power dynamics. So, you know, when we talk about whether a person who is, uh, was, for example, maybe a white male like me um, using hate speech, that's very different for a lot of different power dynamic reasons than when somebody uses hate speech against me. Okay, and in inter again, international human rights, uh, European constitutional law, South African constitutional law, a number of, uh, of folks around the world have done a really good job of trying to figure this out, and they, we're, we're not really writing on a blank slate. We can do this. So I guess what I'm trying to say is, w you know, we're not talking about speech that's hurting somebody's feelings and allowing a kind of a uh, victim to deliver the regulation. That's not really what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is intruding on a dignitary interest that we all have, intruding on our own free speech rights, intruding on equal protection and due process rights and political rights as well, and excluding people from a larger community. What I'd like to do is create a more inclusive, more equal kind of society where we all can have an equal conversation on equal footing and stand up for ourselves in that sort of equal discussion. Okay, I know we're getting close on time. I want to ask one logistical question about how it kind of plays out in real life. Um, in 2017 at Berkeley, I think Berkeley had to spend $600,000 to have Ben Shapiro come speak on campus. I'm curious, both of your thoughts, particularly your thoughts on when speech becomes that costly and potentially dangerous, is it still worth protecting and who should bear the cost for that? Uh, you're damn right it's worth protecting. Uh, first of all, I'm someone who has defended Ben Shapiro numerous times and I can't stand the guy. I also don't understand how he got a radio show because his voice is annoying. Um, <laughs> but what I will say is, what I'm more concerned about is what we're actually saying is, if people are going to terrorize and act like a fool in a civil society, then other people must pay the price for that. So should the child uh, protesters during the civil rights movement, should they have had to pay? because a bunch of people wanted to hose them down and smoke dogs on them, so we sh had to pay more for that? Really? Is that what we're saying as a society? No. People have the right to speak. You have the right to protest them speaking, but you don't have to be horrible when you do it. You don't have to vandalize your own community. You don't have to hurt people. This idea that, okay, I'm going to have a tantrum in the grocery store, and therefore mom is going to be forced to give me a cookie is basically what we're saying. That's what we're saying in the society. If you can cause the biggest headache for a local government, we are gonna put that cause on the person trying to speak and therefore they're supposed to pay more because we can't just teach people to find a more productive way to do it. So case in point, a um, couple years ago there was a funeral um, from, what's that group? Those horrible, disgusting, Yes, we all hate, like, right? That's like the one thing everybody agrees with. Like, they are sick, disgusting people. And there's a couple ways to handle this. And in my town, um, what we did a few years ago is we got everyone in the community together. We held up a bunch of signs and we blocked them. We didn't shout down because we wanted them to be able to enjoy, in, go th enjoy, wrong word, go through the funeral. Um, we were very silent, but we all had big boards and we just covered it so they couldn't see it and we let them yell and we let them s held up their horrible signs and do what they did but the community came out and we just blocked it what should we have done uh, some people said what should I have gone up to those people and punched them in the face should I have uh, made threat should I have made the city council so fearful that they put an extra fee on them so they just didn't come out no you know what that did we actually got letters from that family later in my community 
because they felt like they had people with them. And this is what it's still coming back to, everybody. We can sit here and talk about some friendly entity, which again, we still have not defined. We still don't know how we're defining hate speech. We still don't know how we'd regulate it. We still don't know where it applies to. So security fees for Ben Shapiro, but can I get some security fees for Planned Parenthood when they come to speak? Is that okay? Because there's people that want to do that. Because you know, you're talking about murdering babies. That, that's a legit thing from their point of view. So that's a legit reason where you would think if it rises to that level, right, I'm trying to save unborn babies, then maybe they have the right to throw a brick at your face. So do we want to charge Planned Parenthood more in order to come on a college campus? Doesn't that take services away from things? Or should we be teaching people to learn how to deal with things in a civil way? Because again, if people in this country could learn and figure out a way to get gay marriage for everyone in this country, to have a civil rights movement to make sure women have the right to vote, and that could all be done without us having to lynch and gas and hurt people, are you really telling me we can't make these progressions and this progress today without, again, going to some other entity? So I have to keep coming back to that, you guys, is no, I don't like where this is going at all. Because all we're doing is we're saying we're going to put it on the speaker to have to cover the cost of everyone else's inability to live in a civil society. And that is very dangerous. Final thoughts or thoughts on security when it gets to that extreme level? Yeah, I mean, I fundamentally agree and, and wish that it would never get to that level. I do think that it's important in a university environment, in a law school environment, that we learn to disagree agreeably and that we learn to have civil conversations and try to persuade each other in a civil way. But I also think that hate speech is not a part of that. Right, hate speech tends to shut down conversation and uh, and and do the opposite of what I think we're both agreeing on, and so you know universities, law schools, whoever is inviting these speakers, they have limited resources. They have to pick and choose who they're going to bring to their campus, and as I sometimes tell my students, you know, if a university has a choice to bring, say, two different math professors to speak on campus, are they really going to choose to bring the one who insists that two plus two equals five? I don't think so. And so universities can make a choice, given limited resources, to not bring speakers that they think just are not valuable to the academic discussion at the university for whatever reason. If that person is using hate speech or ad hominems or other kinds of inappropriate arguments that go outside the bounds of civil discourse, I think it's perfectly within a university's right to charge that speaker for security so long as we don't have a heckler's veto problem where the protesters are essentially shutting them down. I do think we ought to promote civil discourse. Thank you both so much. I know you have class. If you have a few minutes, I'm going to hand it off to Sabrina for a quick Q&A. If you have a few minutes. Oh, of course. <laughs> okay. Yes, please. Well, that concludes uh, the majority portion of our debate for tonight, so thank you for coming. Um, we would like to open the floor up for questions now. So if anybody has any questions for our speakers, um, you're more than welcome to ask any. I know most of you have to go to class, so we'll try to make this as quick as we can. Um, in the back for first, thank you. Uh, well, I'll first say that I think social media has been a, a great tool and also the worst headache for this field in the last five years. Um, on the one hand, the same right that allows um, people to run their mouths, right, is the, also the same right that's allowed people to come together. So I've seen so many different activists come together, whether it was Black Lives Matter protesters, uh, uh, Muslim students for Palestine organizations came together throughout the country. The Tea Party started because of social media. So it's helped both the left and the right be able to find one another, i.e. First Amendment freedom of association, come together, bond on a message, and then take that message and advocate for it, right or wrong. I also think it's allowed everyone to be tribal. And I think it's a lot of everybody be that, you know, worst version of yourself is a troll in your basement and just sticking in your own world. And I'm only going to listen to things that agree with me. And I'm only going to look at liberal news. And I'm only going to listen to this. And that's all I'm going to be because I am right. And that's all both sides are doing on the right and the left. Um, but when it comes to what I think their job is, 
why does anybody want Mark Zuckerberg to do anything on this? This is insane. The guy like has no social skills and created Facebook in his basement because he couldn't get a, ba a date in college. Like that's what's going on here, folks. And you guys are giving this guy who had no social skills in his 20s power to regulate you now. That's crazy. The guy wants to be regulated because he doesn't want competition. I've met with Mark Zuckerberg. He's power hungry. Um, there's platforms, there's uh, publishers. At the end of the day, the best thing all of us can do is A, don't give social media all of its power, and B, realizing that it's just another platform, just like the printing press was a platform, just like a newspaper was a platform, and please everyone just get the heck out of your bubble. I think that's what I'm the most concerned with, is everyone's just very tribal. And we're all now using social media as a way to like tattletale on our kid's sister because they got us in trouble for sneaking out at night. And it, I, I just think it's insane. I mean, this is a real problem. And, you know, we have evidence now that social media and, and false claims on social media are having an impact on our politics. And um, what to do about that, you know, is way above my pay grade. I agree with everything that we've heard. I mean, it's, uh, you know, there are great things about social media and there, there are very bad things about social media. Um, and I think we're starting to isolate where the bad things really are. But what to do about that, I think, is a whole different problem. So at Georgetown a couple weeks ago at the law school, a bunch of protesters shut down um, the uh, Homeland Security, the acting director of Homeland Security, I think it was, it was. Um, and nothing happened to the protesters, but a couple of years before that at UCLA, the, um, there was another uh, speech that was being, being given by a Trump um, admin, and protesters shut it down. But the protesters were actually arrested and charged with disturbing the peace. Um, and I'm just curious what your thoughts are on um, protesters uh, in that situation? Um, so I work right now with a lot of legislators, and I personally have a huge problem. I see a lot of bills where it's like this mandatory uh, suspension of, of students if they're caught disrupting something. My biggest problem with it is it's defined so vaguely that your most you know, power-hungry administrator that just doesn't want to deal with you that day because she's annoyed with her husband is going to shut you down. Um, and we all go through it because we just get annoyed and we don't want to hear anybody talk. I can't stand free speech on Saturdays now. I just want to be left alone. Um, so that's part of it. But I do think that there is a problem culturally with some of these campuses, and I've spoken with a lot of university presidents and campus administrators, and there's two problems. One, the biggest growth in your university systems is on the administration side. There's not funding going toward you guys getting more tenured professors. There's not more funding going towards books and scholarships so we can lower everyone's student loan payments. The biggest growth in your higher ed system is coming through these bureaucratic systems. You need more diversity officer here. You need more campus police officer there. You need more this. I.e., you create more bureaucracy, you create more BS, you create more headaches, you get more drama. Um, I also think higher education, someone has turned into a let's make people feel good because it's gotten too damn expensive and it's become a little bit more pointless. Um, and so people are more focused on trying to create a comfort level for students instead of giving them what I think is the saddest thing uh, for law schools recently is you're supposed to take pride in the fact that your school is supposed to be teaching you how to think objectively. I do not advocate whatsoever that you should care about your client's feelings in the, in the pure sense. You should be care about your client's interest in the law. And I'm concerned that there's this focus more on how you feel. And that's really concerning when we're talking about undergrad, but extra concerning when we're talking about professional. Because you're not 17 to 22, you're 24, 25, and I'm gonna need you to grow a thick pair. And your client wants you to grow a thick pair. So I think, yeah, I think absolutely if those protests are happening and those students have actually tried to shut somebody down, they should be held accountable for it. But what I don't like to see is this culture of letting some students do it and not others. Because I've also seen examples where they've shut down and have arrested the pro-life kids because they said that they were disrespecting and it was hate speech to go after the pro-choice students. So again, none of this is gonna turn out well for anybody unless everybody just learns that their feelings don't matter. I had a question for the professor over here because um, one of the comments that you made that stuck out to me was when you said other countries do it better, for instance, and um, Canada, a comedian, 
got fined, I think, 40, 42000 or something for making a joke during a skit. Uh, and in London, I believe it was, a man got uh, put in jail for posting about immigration on Facebook. So you say these other countries do it better. Can I have an actual example? So uh, I'm not saying that they do it better. What I'm saying is that they've given some thought to how to do this. And there's some thinking so that we won't have to write on a blank slate. What I think is most interesting in international human rights and some foreign constitutionalism is that they actually view this as an equal protection and equality problem, not on the speaker's end, but on the society's end. And what's interesting about this is that it goes back to this idea of feelings and not having your feelings hurt. That's not really what this is all about. What it's about is establishing power dynamics and dignitary interests in society that, uh, that anti-hate speech regulation is designed to counter. And so if there's speech out there, whatever it is, that's designed to exclude people because of an immutable characteristic or because of an essential trait that, um, that actually excludes them from the community, from the community's discourse in the way that I've discussed, that's the kind of thing that we're talking about. And, and, and the way international human rights is more and more looking at that kind of problem is, a, is government's failure to protect the equality interests of the victim balanced against the rights of the speaker. And this, again, is something that we don't really do in US constitutionalism. What we tend to do is look at the rights of the speaker and just say, does the speaker have a right to free speech or not? And there are more and more free speech absolutists that say anything goes in, in free speech, right? In the interests of kind of promoting this marketplace of ideas. What other countries are doing, and I think they do this better, I'm not sure the results are always better, but what they're doing is looking more holistically at a body of rights that look at my rights as a speaker, but balanced against your rights as not only as an individual listener, but all of our rights as listeners, right? And those are their digni dignitary interests tied up in that, their equal protection interests tied up in that, and there are even free speech rights tied up in that, because to the extent that my speech is impeding your speech, international human rights is more and more recognizing that we ought to recognize that as a free speech problem on your end. I just want to add to that real quickly, though. Um, Dave Chappelle, right? The people that are getting charged and attacked the most are minorities for speaking out. There was actually just a survey done um, in the work environment. People that are most likely to get pulled into HR for saying offensive things are black people. Um, there was a, just a writer, a black man, that just left writing for Star Trek because he was telling a story about discrimination and one of his white colleagues didn't like the story that offended them. Um, so I want you to pay attention to that. So there's actually five or six different bodies right now internationally that want to try to pull the Dave Chappelle special altogether because they don't like how it offended a mass group of people. So I want you to think about that. In this country, a black man can run his mouth and ain't that a beautiful thing. And in other countries, that cannot happen. And they're trying to stop it here. So that would be my thing again. If Dave Chappelle can run his mouth here, you always have to defend that because that is what they're trying to stop over there. That's it. Thank you, everybody.